think we're about to start. Yeah, this is a workshop. Yep, local policy. Giving it. All right. Okay. Let's start. All right, folks. Welcome. Yeah, this is the 37th National Pesticide Forum. I am Drew Tower, the Community Resource and Policy Director at Beyond Pesticides. We have a great slate of advocates here uh, that are going to tell you about their work. And because we're we have six of them, and we're limited on time. I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, our first speaker is Mary Jones. She's the community organizer for Western Massachusetts and Connecticut at Toxics Action Center and based in Boston, Massachusetts. She's passionate about social justice and community-driven change. Her prior work included nonprofit development in Richmond, Indiana, where she managed several community initiatives focused on food access and food justice. Please welcome Mary. Thanks, Drew. Um, I'm a community organizer, so I, I'm used to easels and charts versus PowerPoints, so this is my virtual easel today. Um, and I also, my parents are pastors, so I really feel like I'm at a pulpit right now, so I apologize if I start sounding like a pastor, it might run in the family. Um, so again, my name is Mary. I am the community organizer at Toxics Action Center. For those of you who don't know us, we're an environmental and public health nonprofit that specializes in organizing with communities on the ground to prevent and clean up pollution. And we do that by training people on how to use the tools in our democracy. So how do you attend a public hearing? How do you get out of vote? Um, how do we leverage the tools that we all should have learned in high school um, in order to make our democracy work? So I work on all sorts of issues, pesticides just being one. So to give you a sense of a little bit of what I'm up to in pesticides, um, I've been working closely with the NOFA Mass chapter on a campaign called the All Sides Campaign. Um, this is a network of activists from all over Massachusetts mainly um, in over 41 towns that are working together, um, sharing resources so that no one's reinventing the wheel. And all of these towns um, are interested in doing something at a very hyper-local level to prevent pesticide use and protect pollinators. Um, and that looks very different in each of these communities. So we have monthly calls with this group where we get on and we uh, do a quick training on a community organizing skill. We build our community because we know that it's gonna take a movement to create the change that we really need to see. Um, and we um, share stories of success and stories of um, troubleshooting so people can um, really pull on each other's expertise. So, great. So for my 10 minutes, I wanted to go over five principles of community organizing around pesticides or other toxic threats. So these are things that we have learned in our 30-year history at Toxics Action Center um, that we have found work time and time again. So the first, is to set an achievable goal. So that sounds really obvious, but what we think of when I think of achievable in the context of this All Sides campaign in Massachusetts is what do we have precedent for? And there's three main things that are happening in Massachusetts that we have some precedent for. So the first being a, um, designating a community to be pollinator friendly, either through your city council or through a town resolution through town meeting. A lot of communities are using this as a wedge um, to then create more stringent pesticide policies to say, well, we made this commitment, we're pollinator friendly, now we have to actually live out that value. We're also working with communities to kind of skip that step and go straight to organic pest management in their town or city. We have a lot of precedent thanks to Chip Osborne's work in Marblehead, Massachusetts. We also heard um, the story of that, origin of that story a little bit earlier as well. And then finally, we work with communities that are dealing with very specific exposures, potentially in housing or other groups where changing policies on town-owned land in Massachusetts because of preemption, that's all we're really able to regulate in the state, um, isn't really going to help folks in that situation that are dealing with pesticide spraying where they live. So in terms of the next principle, it's to pick the right target. So when you want to do one of these things, you can think of a whole ecosystem of decision makers who play some role in making that happen at the local level, right? But ultimately, the buck stops somewhere with a person or a particular group of people. So in terms of the first one, pollinator-friendly communities, it's ultimately a legislative action in Massachusetts. So the buck stops at your select board, your city council, or a town meeting. So in Massachusetts, that means the public, right? If you're going for organic pest management, it's ultimately a regulatory campaign. In Massachusetts especially, we have very powerful boards of health 
and we have multiple communities whose boards of health have instituted organic pest management because they have the authority to step in whenever public health or the environment is at threat. So um, if you're trying to do something with organic pest management, you, it would be great to get the city council on your side, but that's not where the buck stops. That's not where you put most of your energy. And then finally, if you're working on exposure from private land that you might live on or near, um, it's ultimately a corporate campaign. So what I mean by that is you're trying to get a private landowner or enterprise to voluntarily change their practices. And so ultimately, you're just, your target is the owner or whoever is making that policy for that, um, for that piece of land. So the next thing that's really important is to articulate your strategy. So this is people who want to join your group and make change happen. They want to know your plan, right? Like, what's the battle plan? What's, what's, how are we going to get this to happen? So this is just an example of one of the exercises that I run that with many community groups, which is a very basic power mapping exercise. So what you do is you take the name of the individuals on the group of people you're trying to influence because the Board of Health is not some nebulous group, right? The Board of Health is individual people who have stories, who have interests, um, that, and that's ultimately who you have to, whose minds you have to change. So um, what you do is you um, put the names and then you rank them. If the vote was today, if we wanted them to take action today, are they with us? Do we not know? Are they against us? So this is a totally fictional campaign. Um, but we see we've got three boards of health members. That's a, the average of the board of health members in Massachusetts um, in these smaller towns. And in this, you know, in this uh, made up campaign, we've got someone who's a champion, who's a doctor, who's helped write regulations in the past. We've got someone who we don't know quite where they stand, but they have kids and they're active in the PTA. And we've got someone who's just not convinced this is a major issue. Um, so they're leaning against us. So when you're looking at this strategy, you might be tempted to say, we just have to talk to Grace, right? Grace is our champion. But what you really need to do is focus on who you think you can change. So not only are you targeting your board of health, I would say in this case, you're targeting Jose and you're targeting Jane in particular to change their minds. So when we talk about your strategy at Toxic Action Center, we talk about three major buckets. So there's the hero strategy. That's where your group of decision makers is pretty much behind you, almost like the, the gentleman who's in the room this morning from New York. Like, you have someone who's ready to go out there and fight and get in the weeds with you, and what they need is you to cheer them on, right? The other bucket, or the next bucket, is your group of decision makers. They're, they're with you, but they're not going to stick their necks out for you, right? They've got other issues on the table. So what you have to do is give them cover from the public in order to do the right thing. And then finally, we have a pressure strategy. This is where your group of decision makers is pretty much against you. And if they're against you, what you have to do is make it politically inconvenient for them to be against you. And as you can imagine, a tone of each one of these campaigns would be very different, right? So in the example I said earlier, I would say your, your, this would be a cover strategy. Your Board of Health, they have the power to institute organic pest management, and you want to give cover specifically to Jose and to Jane, right? And you think you might be able to do this from getting the public behind you, um, getting support of other groups in town, specifically groups that have these people's ears, and through media attention, because media is always helpful. So the next is to craft a solid message. So at Toxics Action Center, we talk about this in terms of the three, or four, the four Cs. Um, compelling, concise, consistent, and controls the message. These are just some good examples. I, I know the children and pesticides don't mix, I think is in your folder. So really great messaging and stuff around that. Um, I will say if we're talking about kids, it's really powerful to have kids in our pictures, at our public hearings. Um, we need to see them, too. And I want to talk the most about this fourth one, that this controls the message. So I think this is the one that's least intuitive, um, at least to me, uh, when I started doing this work. So when we say control a message, what we mean is we want to be talking about pesticides on our terms. We're not just going to be defending against what the um, corporate interests want us to talk about it. They are framing the issue in certain ways because those are the ways they think they can win. So instead of saying, um, this isn't what the corporation's saying, this isn't, it's not, we just say something totally different. So this is another exercise that we often use with groups where we say, what are the words that we use and what are the words that we want to avoid? Words we want to use are the things we want to pop up in people's minds and Jose's minds and Jane's minds and the public's minds when we talk about this issue. And words to avoid are things that the industry likes us to talk about because they think they can win, right? So this is just a, um, a brainstorm from a call I ran recently in that All Sides campaign of some things people thought were really good ones to use and ones to avoid. 
And I will say that um, on the avoid the science versus science, what I really mean there is we can't win on facts alone, right? We have to, we have to get people over the heart. We have to have the facts behind us. We have to have our due diligence. We have our experts to back us up. But we're really going to win when we talk about children, health, pets. Um, those are the things that are going to get people's hearts. And I have an example at the bottom uh, by a campaign we ran with Kimlon, um, where we called it Refuse to Use Kimlon, Be Truly Green, Why Lawn Care Pesticides Are Dangerous to Your Children, Pets, and the Environment. That's a way to take back and control the message. So the last thing I'll say is you want to grow your group. No matter if you've got a great message, you've got the right target, you, you've done your due diligence and done the power mapping of the decision maker, you cannot win without a group. So I often think of community organizing as a triangle. There's a few people at the top who are doing most of the work and most of the investment. And then there's like a group in the middle who's you know, maybe going out to door to door, will volunteer and go to some meetings. But there's a base behind it. And maybe all this base does is you get them out to that one really important public hearing. You get them out to that petition. And that's what the decision maker needs to see, that all those people stand behind you. Um, and with that, I will say thank you very much. And if you are in the Northeast, um, feel free to come up and talk with me. Um, I'd love to connect. So thank you. Mary, thank you so much. That was an excellent framework for the rest of the discussion that we're going to have here. Um, and I also want to mention that if you have questions for folks on the panel um, as they present, please write them down. We're going to pick them up um, when we have question and answer. We're hopefully going to have 30 minutes for that. Um, our next speaker is Autumn Ness. Autumn is the director of the Hawaii Organic Land Management Project for Beyond Pesticides and a consultant for the Hawaii Center for Food Safety. She's based in Maui, Hawaii, uh, and she's a grassroots organizer and policy consultant to state and county legislators on agriculture, pesticides, and housing policy, and has worked on a number of local and state campaigns to engage average people in the political process, amplify their voices in government, and drive policy. Please welcome Autumn. Aloha, everybody. I second everything that Mary just said. And I'm going to give you some examples about how we used those kinds of things in Maui. Um, so I'll give you a little background while he's doing this. Quick, like four sentence intro about what's going on in Hawaii. On Maui, um, in 2014, there was a ballot initiative to place a moratorium on the growing of GE crops in our county. Um, Monsanto and Mycogen spent more money per voter um, in our county than in any election in the history of the US. And we won. And then they sued us. <laughs> Let's celebrate the win. And then they sued us, and we lost in court. So since then, um, the, our movement has continued to further regulate the chemical companies and lighten the entire pesticide load in our county and state. Um, we successfully passed the nation's first ban on chlorpyrifos, um, a law mandating public disclosure of RUPs. Um, and through all of this, we realized just how much corporations and their money influence our entire political process. So we started to get involved in elections work um, so that our individual issue activism work can get easier in the long run. Um, so we keep hearing today that if we're gonna lighten the pesticide load in our lives, we have to build better food systems, and that's totally true. Um, and that often requires you have to elect leaders um, in your community that understand that and will fund and make policies that support that kind of a change. So um, this presentation, whoa, it's like going without me. What's happening? This presentation um, is a kind of quick overview about the tools that we use to do all of that. Um, and I need to just preface this with, these are not all my ideas. I have a really amazing team in Hawaii that I have the privilege of representing today, but they, this is a lot of teamwork involved. So this is the presentation, how we won against the most money ever spent in a, an election. We built a lasting movement against the chemical industry and leveraged that to influence elections. Um, so this is, I just talked about why we want policy change. In our last election, we chose a slate of candidates that are all good on food policy, and we threw all of our resources collectively across the rider, water rights movement, Hawaiian rights movements, behind these people. Sorry, this keeps going. How do I stop this? <laughs> um, anyway. Huh? Um, so anyway, that's what that looks like. Um, for messaging, I'll image everything that Mary just said. Um, my second point is really important. Industry lobbyists lie. They lie, bold-faced. And it's our job as activists to challenge them. If their lies go unchallenged, their lies become the truth. And the way that you challenge those is by doing your research and presenting the facts in ways that legislators can understand them quickly. So um, these are ways we did that. We illustrated where Monsanto farms are, for example, the yellow 
lines are trade winds, the blue lines are water runoff, so the average person could see that kind of stuff. We took each Monsanto talking point and dismantled it into graphics. So every time a Monsanto rep said, this is gonna cause job loss, we just proved it wrong. Um, so their lies didn't work anymore. Um, we made coloring books for kids, establishing the difference between a, a predative agriculture system and a regenerative agriculture system. It's really easy, anyone can understand it. This was huge. To pass the mandatory RUP disclosure law, um, the argument that RUP or pesticide regulations harm small farmers um, was something that even I as an activist had kind of accepted as fact until we started doing research. We FOIA'd the RUP sales data for our state for three years and we proved that entire industry part, um, talking point wrong by analyzing 9,000 points of data. I can't get this thing to stop, I'm really sorry. Um, and making it, putting it into a visual that the legislators could understand in one look. And we passed the law. Um, so again, it's just research. Um, we don't have a lot of money. The chemical companies have endless funding to own the radio and the TV and the lobbying. Um, so we go cheap with signage and radio and knocking on doors. We hand paint signs whenever the industry comes up with a new um, talking point, we repaint the signs and we <laughs> challenge it. Um, and we have people standing, um, standing on the side of the road. Um, it's free and usually these are people that your community knows anyway. So um, we make a series of signs. This is our sketch for our get out the vote. We made a series of highway signs. So as you're driving, you get a separate message every couple hundred feet. Um, this is a really big get out the vote. Um, we made a calendar. We have an organization called Babes Against Biotech, so we highlighted local women who are farmers or scientists and sold this as a fundraiser. Um, we put graphics on our local uh, health food cafe tables and change them out every week, so when you go to eat dinner, this is what you're looking at. Um, we did this action at the opening day of our state legislature, which got us on the front page of the newspaper for free. Um, we tapped our local graffiti and hip hop community to really get out. We took a page out of Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez's book this last election and we needed to um, inspire new people to vote. So we did, we got graffiti artists and we have hip hop artists. We gave out these CDs, we went old school. And we gave out CDs with hip hop tracks on it about why it's important to vote. Um, and these popped up all over the islands. Um, on the right side, do you see those signs, election signs, that one that's a guy is actually a cardboard cutout. We made like a, a bunch of these signs for Shane Sinensi, realizing that people vote largely on name recognition. And we made a hashtag called where is Shane on social media. And people were posting selfies with this guy. And it worked, I mean, he won. I don't know how much of a <laughs> um, role the signs played, but we made flyers about how dire our voter turnout is and we, found the neighborhoods where we know our supporters live but have really low voter turnout and we flyered the neighborhoods about how to vote. Um, this last one is really, or this next one is really important, community. Like Mary said, well, you can't do this with 10 people even if 10 people are working around the clock. You need community. This is, I, when I was doing this presentation, I was looking through my iPhone photos and this, these are all the photos people were sending me during election week. This is my iPhone camera roll right here. Um, people were going to vote, in, vote and sending me selfies with their I Voted stickers so we could make posters with them. Um, tapping diverse leaders from your community to bring your message to diverse parts of the community is the strongest thing that we did. I cannot walk into a Hawaiian or a Filipino community and tell them how to vote or what to think. So we asked leaders in each of those communities. On the left, that's Uncle Alika, and he brought in young Hawaiian men years ago and all of these leaders that are in this picture with him now are now leaders in our movement because of him and that wouldn't have happened if i had tried to to get them involved so that's really really important um, we staged marches with messaging in mind like mary said you need to own the message so we did these giant marches and we printed banners that say monsanto poisons hawaiian land like straight to the point i'm not going to argue with them about how their ge crops are feeding the world that's not my point my point is that you're poisoning us so we staged these marches, printed banners, and they got on the front page of the paper. Um, this is another example of how um, you need to have various people bringing your message forward. On the right is a local surf hero icon. His name is Kai Lenny. So we had people like him do Facebook Live videos from when they went in to vote. Because Facebook Live, FYI, 
has a better, the, um, the, a the algorithm brings it to more people than it, just a post. So we had people go to the early voting site and do live videos and like, hey, it wasn't that hard. It took me three minutes. I didn't understand one of the questions, so I just skipped it, you know? Like, <laughs> made it really easy for people to understand how to vote. Um, we have events that um, help local farmers and end up in the paper. This one was called Outgrow Monsanto. Incidentally, Neil Young showed up at this one and played a concert for us in the middle of a farm, which was amazing. Um, strategic use of social media, because it's free, is a really big um, part of what we do. We do graphics. Um, educating the public, and every single graphic that we have is a call to action or something like that. I want to give a special shout out to Canva. Does anybody not know what Canva is? Canva is a free internet graphic design tool that this entire presentation is made on, plus all of my social media graphics that you're going to see, and it's incredibly intuitive. If I can use it, anybody can use it, um, and it's just a game changer. So when we use social media, this is an example of one hearing. The one on the left, we put out that we need calls. This is the rep you got to call, and this is what you got to ask for. And then we went to the hearing. We live stream the hearing so people can watch what's going on, and we give updates in the comment box while people are watching it so they know what's going on. We really engage our watchers. And then at the bottom, it passed, so we have people call Rep Luke and give her a thank you um, so that we engage everybody in every step of the process. Same thing here. Um, we were out in the community and we heard people say, I can't vote because I have to work. So we may, once you hear that three or four times, you know that that's a, that's a consensus in your community, right? People think, oh, I can't register, I can't vote because I'm not registered. Probably 50 more people think that. So we made graphics and we boosted them on Facebook. I think each boost is like 20 bucks and it reaches like 10,000 people each. Um, let's see. Again, we um, had a gra an artist paint this really well-known building on Maui with a go vote, turned it into a graphic, telling people that voting is open, and then the day the election was finished, we let them know, hey, you guys, nice work. You showed up. It worked. We had 7,000 more voters this year than last year. So we want to engage everyone in the process every step of the way so they know that what they're doing is working. Um, and the last really important thing that I learned, I wish I would have learned this earlier, is that um, you can write your own press releases. You don't have to wait for the media to mess up your message. We learned how to write a press release, and we planned events specifically with messaging and photos in mind. And the thing about making your own press release is you can define the language. When you're talking about Monsanto, you don't have to call them a farm. You can call them a chemical company. And back in the day, a few years ago, when they were in Maui News, they were talking about them as farmers. Now, a reporter in the Maui News will talk about Monsanto as a chemical company. And that started because we started writing our own press releases. And if you look, this is, our, this is like my experiment to see how far we could push this. Um, if you look at the paragraph on the right, the quote, Monsanto's business model depends on selling the public the idea that there's a food shortage and that we cannot make enough food to feed ourselves without GMOs or poisonous chemicals. That's simply not true. A newspaper would never have printed that on their own. But we wrote the press release. And sometimes newspapers are so short-staffed, they'll print your press release verbatim, typos and everything. It's crazy. So, so use that tool. And if, if you tell them that you're going to send them photos and footage of your event and they don't even have to come, you're just doing that reporter's job for them and they're stoked. So, um, okay, that's it. Thank you so much. <laughs>
really highlight some of the things that are already covered. Um, I just want to show you about Maryland. This is Maryland. This is a very odd shaped state. Um, we've got Montgomery County, the green uh, little block, and we're right next to Washington, D.C. Um, we're the largest uh, county in the Maryland, and also we have the most um, uh, uh, population, one million people. Um, Maryland has four seasons. Some of the landscaper companies probably don't know that. Um, we also have uh, Johns Hopkins University, their campus, and their uh, hospital. And uh, something here doesn't belong. Uh, we are, Montgomery County is also home to Rachel Carson, and her home in Silver Spring is open once a month, I mean once a year. Um, so, and uh, one of the reasons, I'm here as a mom, um, so we, um, sorry, um, one of the re things that carry us is, is to know your why. Um, this is my why. Um, when she was four years old, our community was spraying, and I was frustrated, and I said an offhand comment, say, I wish somebody would do something about this, and I said to her, maybe when you grow up, you can do something, and she looked at me, and she asked, why can't you? She was right. You know, our kids don't want our mess. You know, they don't want to fix it, they want us to fix it. And a good thing for the New York uh, kindergartners because they are fixing something that, you know, they, the parents are not, you know, people are not fixing, so they feel like they have to take up that mantle. My kids did not want to do that, <laughs> so here, we, uh, here I am. Um, I meet a lot of people who, who feel um, that they are, they're, they're just kind of sad that this is happening, but they don't know what to do, and so they just kind of give up their power. So I just want to remind people that you guys have superpowers. Um, you have supervision, you know, you can envision the possibilities. Um, a lot of times people can't even contemplate that it could be pesticide free. So a vision carries people, it excites people, it motivates people, and it gets people behind you or even with you. Um, you have people power, and that is one of our strongest things that we really built on. Um, people power is just about anybody you meet. Um, so we, we use coalitions, we did partners, supporters, neighbors, um, just talking to, to everybody that we meet. And there's the power of persuasion. All of the tools that are available to you, the sciences, the news, you know, uh, all of those are available to you to, per to persuade uh, both people and lawmakers. Um, this is their vision. So it's not that hard to beat that vision. So. Yeah, <laughs> and it's so last century. Um, this is the city of Tacoma Park. Um, they passed a safe growth zone ordinance in uh, 2013. Uh, they are the first city in the U.S. to have passed a cosmetic lawn pesticide ordinance that bans uh, pesticide use for the look of a lawn on both private and city property. Um, and so their vision was you know, we want a place where people can grow, pets can grow, wildlife can grow, and food can grow. We can grow our own food safely without exposure to harmful pesticides. Really simple message, vision for, for people to get behind. Um, and it was just started by two women, Julie uh, Taddeo, the run on the right, and, uh, and Catherine Cummings on the left. And they're just two moms who was sick and tired of having their kids exposed to pesticides in their community. Um, and so Tacoma Park, it has 16,000 residents. Uh, they did petition gathering. They didn't even use any of the electronic tools or anything. They just went, you know, neighbor to neighbor, people pe to people, you know, anybody they know. Uh, they went to uh, community events, farmers markets, collecting signatures. And they only collected maybe about four to 500 signatures, but that was enough to convince lawmakers, hey, we need a bill for this. And, uh, and they, the, the city council members uh, voted through unanimously after a, a, a very robust debate. Um, so that's that. 
And so in Montgomery County, we're like, well, hey, we want that. We like that vision. So we're going to do that too. So uh, Safe Girl Montgomery, we like, we're going to take that. And we even recycle the people from Tacoma Park. There's Julie Taddeo in the back. And uh, so, we, so you don't need a lot of people for this campaign. It was the core. Uh, there's one person missing. Uh, uh, six people here in our message, which basically pesticide-free lawns for safer communities. That's what we want. Um, so, and of course, our our membership grew, and we uh, built coalitions, and um, we we became like a 50-member coalition. We just reached out to. Uh, or any organization that's willing to talk to us, we talk to show them how our issues connected with what they're working on, how we can help each other. And it wasn't just that, oh, you're a member of us. Now we're like, okay, so you're a member, so help us get these, uh, get the word out, help us send out these action alerts. And I have to thank Beyond Pesticide, who has been a fantastic coalition member. Um, they uh, supported us at every step of the way and even Chip Osborne, who's come down to uh, many of the hearings and also uh, have been helping our parks. So we are really, really appreciative of our, uh, of our membership members there. Um, and the, you also have the power of persuasion, which is the petitions, emails, science, you know, stories, personal stories are powerful. Um, those are the stories that move lawmakers. Um, we use a lot of photos. This was a photo in my neighborhood. I would leave the photo with the lawmakers. And you know what? It's something they cannot unsee once they see it. This is a boom truck just spraying the grass in our community. Um, social media, we used it to the max. Um, and letters to the editor. And of course, we did also write our own press releases and um, and and also we try to do like uh, special hashtags right now we're doing tag toxic lawns so people can you know take a picture where they see toxic lawns like at the hospital and just send it to us so we can just kind of collect that energy um, here's uh, our social our Facebook page again another photo we left with the lawmakers um, this is our parks this park was sprayed by with Roundup, and the kids were allowed to play. And so that that is um, something that that we share with lawmakers also. And we also uh, reached out to experts. This was uh, Dr. Philip Landrigan, and he wrote a letter in support of the legislation. So uh, we we're really appreciative to to uh, Icahn School of Medicine and Dr. Philip Landrigan. Um, so the Healthy Lawns Act was passed in 2015. Um, there is a council member, George Leventhal, right in the center with the glasses. And so we found a really um, supportive uh, champion for the bill, and, and he's been tremendous uh, carrying the bill. And this was our support with the co our coalition members gathering huge amounts of people out to the hearings. And so uh, we just flooded the, the place. <laughs> and this is the Healthy Lawns Act. Basically, it stops the use of cosmetic lawn pesticides on both private and county-owned properties. And, but the, right now, the private property section of the bill is in appeals court. Obviously, the industry took us to court. But we still won some things. We still have all of our county playgrounds are now pesticide-free. Uh, we're starting, the parks are starting a parks transition that is completely pesticide, to be completely pesticide free. They've taken 10 parks towards that direction and they are going to be working on demonstration playing fields. And, and also our county is starting to do education and outreach on this issue before they wouldn't even bother. But we did have to compromise on some things. You can't get everything in one bill. So uh, this is a smart, uh, Maryland, Maryland Smart and Pesticides Coalition, they work at the state level. Obviously, at the state level, there's a lot more heavy lifting to do. You have a lot of, we have about 200 lawmakers, and, um, and, and so this is a 100 coalition organization. In 2016, Maryland banned uh, neonics to be killing pesticides, and this year we worked on the chlorpyrifos. Unfortunately, that bill died this past week because of the powerful farm lobbyists. 
Um, so shift happens, you know. Uh, so a couple years ago, I was at the main talk, and now there's just so much more energy around this issue. So uh, the change is amazing, okay? And that's our pesticide-free parks uh, thing. And, and this picture is from Boulder, Colorado, um, per, uh, a parks worker picking the weeds. So yeah, we can put this stuff, bury it, and get rid of it, so. <laughs> Um, and please join us for the ground war. A part of our story will be told on that tonight. And uh, yeah, let's go out and banish these toxic pesticides. And there's my info if you guys like. Oh, and we also have free uh, yard signs that you can take back. Uh, and, and we have um, some sample things that we use as part of our campaign over there. Thank you so much, Ling. We really appreciate your work, and it's really inspiring. You know, uh, who else is going to do it but you? You know, you got to get out in your community. You got to get engaged. Um, and we're going to uh, hear now from another great uh, individual from another great organization, uh, People and Pollinators Action Network. We have Joyce Kennedy, and she's the chief coordinator at that organization. And in this multifaceted role, she directs organizational development and project implementation. She, she leads the organization's advocacy work, builds constituencies, and develops community outreach programs. She's worked as an environmental professional for 20 years for consulting firms, nonprofits, and the National Park Service. Please welcome Joyce. So great to be here alongside this wonderful panel. I'm so grateful to have this opportunity. Thank you. Um, just, you just hit enter. Is that the? You're doing the same. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Space. So, People and Pollinators Action Network, or PPAN for short, is an advocacy organization, and we're working to improve policies to better protect pollinators, people and really biodiversity overall by increasing safe habitat, reducing pesticide use, and really trying to improve management practices. And we're based in Colorado, and we are a fairly new organization. And so we've been working really to build relationships and a strong state presence at this point. Sorry, I'm just getting the hang of <laughs> not being on a Mac. <laughs> um, so we have found some early success really by building strategic partnerships. And the running theme here today will be how we've been looking for gaps in what the current policy is not doing. And that's really quite a bit so far. And really looking for um, non-controversial sort of things to start with so we can open up conversations and really change the focus a bit. This keeps jumping, I'm sorry. General, yeah, the space bar, okay. Generally speaking, it's, it's fairly difficult to talk about pesticide policy reform in Colorado because there is a strong agrochemical presence and so we're starting out by working to raise awareness and really the less controversial sort of topics. And those can be talking about food supply. We've found talking about bees is a really good one. Talking about healthy habitat. Generally bringing the pollinator issue to the table. We will talk about honeybees really as a gateway to some of these topics. But then we quickly work to educate people about native pollinators and then start to make those intersections with how people's health are impacted as well and biodiversity generally. You're going to help me? <laughs> Is it just no, this? This one. Oh, this one. Yep. Okay. But I just want to go down here. So we've just generally found these, because environmental topics can be hard to open conversations about, and people can get really negative or down, but we found that these are good opening the door sort of conversations. 
But now we, Colorado has three branches of government in democratic control, so we think there may be a bit of a unique opportunity to broaden the conversation at this point. And we certainly have been ramping up the urgency of our message because of the recent studies that are showing the catastrophic global insect biomass decline. And really, there's the time sensitivity of working on the problem. So we, we really are adding urgency to it without going too negative. We've also found success working with state agencies. And since the state is the second largest landowner next to the federal government, we really think this has great potential and wide ranging positive impacts are certainly possible. So we intend to keep working with state agencies and also open up conversations with other state agencies that really have relevance to our work and with a democratic governor who is appointing some great state agency leaders, we think those conversations really can help move us forward. So by working alongside the Department of Transportation, we were able to get the first Colorado Pollinator Highway designated at the state capitol. And it was bipartisan and unanimous, and this really sent a strong positive message to our residents. There's really a strong educational component in that, so it was a good starting place for us as a new organization. But it also, it, it really is having an impact because CDOT is now developing new protocols for managing the corridors along the highways. So they're only mowing now at the end of the growing season, which is good for habitat. And the spraying program is much reduced where it m used to be more of a broadcast approach. Now it's, a it's going to be a spot spraying program. And so as the Department of Agriculture, or the Department of Transportation rolls out these protocols across their regions, this could be a money saver for the state, less labor, less resources used, and one of those sort of win-win opportunities. And when you think about, we have over 9,000 miles of right-of-way along state highways in the state. Again, this is a really great potential for increasing habitat. And it, it's a way to respond to habitat loss. It's not the only place. Obviously, highway corridors are not pristine, but they're a place where we can build habitat. This measure has also been a big hit with, our, with the public and our volunteers, and we co-hosted the first pilot highway pollinator planting in November. And so that was exciting, and it brought, even though it was pretty far from Denver, it brought out a lot of volunteers, which was great. The day that the vote took place at the Capitol on the House floor, we brought honeybee observation hive and you should have seen the, uh, the legislators buzzing around. So that was a really fun way to keep this light and again, really positive. And so we are starting out as an organization trying to build these relationships, keeping it fun. We also work with partners that bring pollinators to the Capitol for a legislative breakfast that we host each year. And so that's becoming a tradition that the legislators love to come out for and again, another great conversation opener. We've also asked the governor for the past two years to designate June as Pollinator Month, which that was successful. We've done that again. Uh, you know, another educational opponent to component to raise awareness. Another state, uh, another gap that we identified was that no state agency was taking responsibility for insect management generally, but particularly pollinator management. So we went to the Department of Natural Resources about this. The Department of Agriculture does have some limited, does some limited work on honeybees and management of honeybees, but really very little. We needed to explain to them that honeybees are more of a livestock species. So that's appropriate. 
Um, but for DNR to have some responsibility for pollinators makes a lot more sense. And they, they actually agreed with that and released a new pollinator policy at the end of last year. So this is a continual education process because um, directors change and we, we have to make sure these things are implemented, but we will continue to do that. We also brought together a round table of some of these state agencies. Some of they, they're not necessarily sharing their work. So to bring them to the table and talk about the current work they're doing and also how they can collaborate down the road, I think it takes them out of their bubbles and that can be really useful. At the local level, we've been, and I've heard this mentioned by others, advocating for pollinator resolutions to be passed. They're a low hanging fruit sort of policy opportunity to be passed at, in cities. We've done that in five cities, including Denver. They don't have the regulatory teeth, but again, it opens up the door to conversation. Since the policy term doesn't always resonate with all our constituents, it is important to continue that grassroots educational work for building support and understanding. And so through our Pollinator Safe Communities program, we have the signs, we educate people about how to better manage their land. And this is also that way of engaging people and working them up that ladder of engagement helps us to identify local advocates that really do want to make local reform, but maybe they didn't quite know it yet. <laughs> Lastly, there's been little to no legislation at the state level in Colorado to protect Coloradans from toxins. And so we just recently launched the concept of a toxins coalition in Colorado. So this will help us identify some of the issues that are important to people and build a strong advocacy group to bring them to the, into the limelight. And just to finish up, and I wanted to mention as a side note, uh, because Paula is going to be talking about her children's work next. When I lived in Connecticut, I did work on the coalition that worked to ban pesticides on school grounds for pre-K through middle school. And that's really been informing the work that we're going to be doing on the New Toxins Coalition because you really need that deep bench of support to work on pesticide policy reform. So thanks so much. Thank you, Joyce, for discussing the great work that PPAN is doing out in Colorado. And so you all have heard from folks uh, from across the country, but if you want to get engaged in New York City, we're going to now hear from ways that you could uh, hear about ways that you can do that. And uh, Paula Rogovin is going to speak first here. And she was recently retired after teaching 44 years in New York City public elementary schools. She co-founded Educators Against Racism and Apartheid in New Jersey, the weekly and the weekly. T-neck Peace Vigil, the Coalition to Ban Unsafe Oil Trains, and Don't Gas the Meadowlands Coalition. She's written several books, which she wrote to assist educators in developing social justice curriculum, including the research workshop, Bringing the World into Your Classroom. Please welcome Paula. Thanks. Can you put your mic away, please? Oh, okay. Hi. Thank you so much to Beyond Pesticides. Thank you to it's so much fun being on this coalition of activists. It's wonderful. Um, I'm starting, I, I'm not used to talking quite so fast, but I'm trying to squeeze this into 10 minutes. Um, so um, this is my philosophy of education that I like to share with my student teachers. Um, and with the children, I want to empower them um, to become activists in the future. So this is, this is, I don't want them to learn just to learn how to take tests. I want them to, to, to learn to think critically and to become um, activists. So here we go. In the beginning of the year, the very beginning of the year, first day, we were studying, for example, in kindergarten. I taught first grade uh, for 36 years and, and then kindergarten for the last few years. And we we're learning about our school. So they got to make a list of the things they wanted to know, whether it was about the glass windows or the carpets or the desks or what this is made from, who works in our school. They got to choose the topics. 
So in 2014, they chose tomatoes. They, were ta they wanted to learn about foods in our, in our lunchroom, our cafeteria. When, when I uh, worked with my student teachers and we were setting up our research groups, we tried to make it uh, interdisciplinary. What, what literature can we use? What science is there in this? Um, what social studies, what art can we do, and so on. And for me, I always, 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 always tried to think as we were planning about social issues and social action. Not imposing it on them, but letting it evolve from their research. Um, I'm interested in the pesticide issue. We boycotted grapes and lettuce way back. Uh, when I was a kid, and so the interest, it interested me, but I didn't want to impose it on them. It doesn't work when you impose things on kids. So I tried to find a natural way for it to evolve. Uh, the kids first thought about what they knew about tomatoes, and I'm not gonna let you read all this because it will take too long, but you know, sometimes it wasn't accurate information, sometimes it was. Um, that was our job as researchers to figure out what was accurate, what wasn't. Then they asked a ton of questions. Um, these are a few of the other questions. So I, as we plan, we looked through their list of questions. Our research was based on their questions. And I thought, well, question um, nine was important because it was like, it will help us um, with some of the basics about how tomatoes are grown and the issue of pesticides could come up. And then uh, one of the questions, why do we have to wash tomatoes before we eat them? Uh, and critical to research is like, how are you gonna find answers? Because when we were kids, the, we found all our information where? Encyclopedia. Yeah, in the encyclopedia. <laughs> and I definitely don't want the kids to do that. Um, they probably don't even have an encyclopedia. But I want them to think of all different ways of finding answers. And it's fun when you do that. Um, that's our, our um, gym teacher and his kid is the one with the green shirt. I taught both of his children. And he's a terrific chef also. So he uh, taught us how to make tomato sauce and, and uh, pasta. And the kids were wondering um, why he went and washed the ingredients first. Some of the kids knew from home. Oh, my mom told me there's some pesticides on. A lot of the kids didn't know, but you, you just find the kids who know something about it, and they also become teachers, or their parents, or their grandparents. So um, we pretended that we were growing tomatoes. We, we looked in some books, but then we pretended to be growing tomatoes. We pretended we either, whether it was a garden or we were working on a farm. And um, so we'd plant the tomatoes and, and the kids were, I told them there were some little bugs on them, some little aphids, you know, that grow on these tomato plants. And so I said, no problem at all, no problem. And I got some pretend pesticide, you know, it's air pesticides, you know, and, and squirt the pretend tomato plants in our role play. And before I know, and then I directed some of the kids to start scratching their legs, <laughs> scratching their arms, and coughing. Um, some of the symptoms of, that farm workers and groundskeepers and others have to face. I even brought in some of my tomatoes from home, tomato plants, brought them in a pot, and you can see the little marigolds over there, um, and they are my little anti-pesticides. You know, some of you, all of you probably know that tomato, uh, that uh, aphids hate the smell of marigolds. So they're really good, what we learned, to, what we called nature's pesticide. We documented our research. We learned about hornworms and aphids, and you know we use all different books, and we learn from other people. Uh, this book is fabulous. Please, please enjoy that book. It's it's so great. It's got all sorts of information about different pesticides, um, nature's pesticides, uh, to the parents, and I work very closely with the parents, the families. 
um, so some parents told me about this farm and we Skyped the farmers and um, they that it's an organic farm. It was too far from our school, we couldn't go there. But I did go there and um, gave them the book we wrote because every interview we did, we wrote a book and we used those books for reading instead of using, you know, basal readers and that kind of stuff. We used the books we wrote. Um, th these two grandparents, um, I taught both, those are their two grandkids. They, um, they're active in Long Island. And since I had written the bulletin to the parents in my class, do you know anybody who's been involved in the, in the anti-pesticide movement? Jerry and Iris came to class wearing those signs. And that was fun when they walked in the room. And they also showed us this experiment that we did. There was a, the first container had soil and fake pesticides, or some baking soda or whatever. And underneath it was blue and that represented the water table and or groundwater. And so the kids became the rain. They poured the rain into it and they could see how the pesticides went down into the water table. And that got them all concerned about um, the rivers, the lakes, the fish. And you know, these are kindergarten kids and, and, and they, they're very interested and they're very passionate about these kinds of, and they have a lot of worries. Like, I, I'm gonna hurry up. Okay, whoopsie. We wrote about that. Oh, just really fast. So they want, we wanted to know, and the kids asked them, how did you try to get a law? Because this is, to me, one of the most important things. You all discussed it on a grown-up level. We, we did it on a kid level. So Jerry said, well, we called the, role, the lawmakers. So we pretended to do that. We role-played it. Nothing. Did that work? No. We wrote letters. We pretended to do that. Did that work? No, usually not, maybe some. Um, and we, they went through a list of things they did. And then, so what did you do? Well, we marched, so there we are. And there were other parents in the room, you know, because we always invited them to our interviews. And so we marched around the room shouting. <laughs> There's a book we wrote about them, about the interview. And then the kids were upset about this thing, the pesticide stuff. And I don't like leaving kids depressed or angry because it's wrong. So be proactive, what can we do? And so they made a list of what we could do. We ended up doing all of those, but over time, this is over time, this is over months. Uh, we wrote the play, look at that father made the, the praying mantises with the kids. We had our ladybugs in the play. Oh, this was so fab fabulous. I had met Julie Chavez Rodriguez, Sh recognize the name? Yeah, well, she was working in the Obama White House and I was at an anti-war meeting with her and a bunch of other people and, and I said to her later in the year, could you, if you ever come to New York, could you come to our classroom? There she is. We did a play for her, we made a mural for her and it was a lot of tears of, of joy. It was great. Okay, then Ben Kalos, uh, Councilman Kalos came into the room in 2014 and then he invited us to City Hall. There we were in City Hall. I'm trying to go so fast. Well, um, it was, it's slow getting legislation. It's really slow. That was in 2015, he called the school. He said, can we have a press conference? We had a press conference in the backyard of the school. I'm introducing o intro 0800 tomorrow. So that was so exciting, but it was so slow. A couple years later, they told us, oh, we're gonna have, a, there's gonna be a hearing finally at City Hall. And there we are. It was 60 children, old, my old kids, my new kids, four years worth of kids, and 60 adults. And there we are at, at City Hall. That was last year. There we are, oh, look at some of you recognize yourself in this picture. Uh, Dr. Sarah Evans, Ben Kalos, Jay Feldman. And it, this was so exciting. We had a, a forum at the school. Even parents spoke. Those are three of the parents from our school. And we formed a coalition with, with Patty and Doug and, and a whole bunch of other groups. And Beyond Pesticides was involved. In, and a lot of local groups got involved. And here we are. We have a, the bill is going to be, we worked over the last year to improve on the bill 
and you see there's still some discussion and debate about exactly what it should say, and, uh, but it's going to be reintroduced on the 18th. Uh, please sign up or speak to me if you want to get involved in helping reach out to uh, lawmakers. And if you want to see this whole thing on YouTube, Charlie Olson from Environment TV made a video of the whole process from the beginning to, well, no, we don't have the end yet, because the <laughs> end is going to be this year. We hope to get it passed. Um, and that will, Charlie promised to do the end for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paula. Awesome teacher. We need you in every classroom throughout the United States. <laughs> All right, next up we have Mitchell Cohen. Mitchell coordinates the No Spray Coalition in New York City, which successfully sued the city government over its indiscriminate spraying of toxic pesticides. He was the editor of the national newspaper Green Politics and of the New York State Green Party newspaper. He's written several books and has a new one on sale here at the forum called The Fight Against Monsanto's Roundup, The Politics of Pesticides. Please welcome Mitchell. So could you let me know when my half hour is up? <laughs> People don't contract cancer. They're made to have cancer. There's a verb missing, and the way we think, the framework that we use, is missing in the way it's presented in the media and in much of our movement as well. The people who are making us have cancer, the institutions, their interests are different than ours. They are the enemy. And we need to think of that as the enemy, and suddenly things flip. We talk about system change. You can't get there. You can't legislate system change, however valid it is to get needed legislation. What we need is revolution in this country and in other countries around the world. How do we do that? People are not hungry. What do you think? So I say that, what, what is your response? People are made hungry. Who the hell is making them hungry? Who has taken their land that, on which people survive for millennia, converted it into genetic engineering cassava or genetic engineering wheat or genetically engineered corn so that make it for export. People are not hungry. They are made. We need to put that verb back in there and things change a little bit when we do. And our thinking changes a little bit when we do. So we look at, let's look at one country. There's seven countries in the world that have banned the cultivation, it's a funny word, in the book Martha Herbert talks about how it's not cultivation, how it's in this book, in uh, the difference between producing and cultivating. So I'll use the producing part. There are seven countries in the world that have banned producing and planting genetically engineered crops. One of them happens to be Venezuela. People don't know that. The U.S. is about to go to war with Venezuela. The anti-war movement is connected in an integral way with the pesticide, the anti-pesticide movement, with the anti-genetic engineering movement for the revolution that we are trying to accomplish, whatever form that takes, but it's supposed to take on a form that we would all want and that we all share. I, believe, because I'm talking to organizers here. So I would give this talk a little bit differently if I was talking in, in my neighborhood of Bensonhurst, although there are still pretty radical people there too, but it's a little bit different. So when we realize that people, not only people, these, in, these interests are, have a different set of approaches, what they're trying to accomplish than we are, 
everything flips. Why did all these organic companies, some of which I saw on there, some of which sponsored some of the groups we're a part of that are even sponsoring <laughs> groups here today, yet they supported in California agribusiness's campaign. They funded agribusiness campaign so that genetic engineering was not required to be listed on labels. And they defeated, narrowly defeated, the people's resolution to add genetically engineered and to let people know. And some of the biggest companies that are in the organic movement funded that. They're enemies, they're not our friends. I don't want to partner with them, I want to destroy them. I want to take them over and turn them into something that we could use. So that's part of it. And when I came to these uh, thoughts, these uh, came back through to in 2000 uh, and, and 1999, New York City began spraying pesticides on us and to kill mosquitoes that they said were going to murder us or kill us. And, and it turned out in that first year, there were a total of four people in New York City that died from West Nile virus, they said, out of, out of thousands that have died from the flu or thousands that died from other things. But it was West Nile that was the emergency, not any of the other things. And they massively sprayed the entire city they sprayed people on the subways. They sprayed people eating outside in the restaurants. They sprayed the parks. Mayor Giuliani was out there. It's perfectly safe, he said. You can drink it. Drink the malafion that they were spraying. He's saying the same thing today in a different way, right? <laughs> but it wasn't only Giuliani. Then it went to Mayor Bloomberg, for those in New York who know Bloomberg was considering running for president this year. Mayor Bloomberg intensified the spraying. And then it went to Mayor de Blasio. A lot of us thought, well, he's a progressive person, right? He's going to finally listen to us. Well, no, the spraying is still going on. Some of us here have gone to his office repeatedly, talked to him personally before he became mayor. Didn't matter. Didn't matter if you were a Democrat or Republican. Didn't matter if you were on this issue, it didn't matter if you were Trump or Clinton. So we had Hillary Clinton traveling. I mean, I won't say anything about Trump because we all know about that. But Hillary Clinton, people don't know, she traveled around the world talking in favor of genetic engineering. So did Jimmy Carter, despite some of the good things that he's done. Genetic engineering, we're going to feed the world as if people are hungry in the world because their land was, <laughs> you know, their land was stolen by these companies. I talked about that already. So how we frame the issue is really important, I think. And that's what I want to talk. There are certain things that come up repeatedly in our organizing that, I th and I think it's similar. Uh, there's the issue of waivers. So just when we think we have a legislative victory, suddenly they add in, well, in case of an emergency, we were going to have uh, put in this waiver or exemption, and then we could have a 40-day or a 10-day or a year-long or some exemption, and then we could spray in that time or use pesticides. And that's in every single bill all over the country. There are these exemptions that they could use. And in New York, that's how year after year they were able to spray because they kept, and they admitted this, they gave it to themselves. The Department of Health decided that it was an emergency when it wasn't. And they called it a waiver, and they gave themselves a waiver, and they continue to spray year after year. Um, now they're using, as some people, as Paula and others have said, uh, they're spraying Roundup. I won't only call it glyphosate, but Roundup, because Roundup includes arsenic, and includes POEAs, and includes other things in it, in addition to the glyphosate. And that sprayed not even for any emergency reason now. They're not even saying that. It sprayed to weed the cracks between the sidewalks so that the, when the weeds come up, not even in parks, but on the sidewalks where children play, 
and wheel their bicycles or we wheel wheelchairs and bring it into our homes. So all these things, they come up again and again. I have a whole list of things that come up again and again, but the time is running out already. So I would love us as organizers to talk about what are those things that keep coming up again and again and how we can organize around that to prevent those from happening and how do we build not only an informational network because yes, people need information, but a lot of people know this stuff inherently. What they need is to be around people who are active, who are, have hope that they're gonna change things and a guide towards changing that. It's not just, you have an empty head, let me tell you what you should be thinking. It's not that at all. I agree with Paula totally on how you teach children, but not only children, how you organize. You organize by getting people to come to things that they're interested in, and they didn't know that, they were, that there were other people also interested in the same thing. And when that silence is broken around people, suddenly people themselves, they come to their own conclusions. They understand, and then we organize. So let's talk among ourselves about how these things come up over and over again. Um, I have a bunch of things that come up, but I didn't have, get a chance to talk about them. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mitchell. Thank you very much. This is a serious issue, and I appreciate those sober words. Um, do we have uh, questions? Does it, can some, collect some questions? Does anybody have uh, any written down that they want to start pass on up? I thought if they shout it out. If not, then let's just raise a hand. If anybody hasn't written down, I'll take that first. Okay, let's go. Yes. So, so we mobilize people in groups uh, around direct action communities and we nurture those communities. I'll give one example so, and then other people can. In a bunch of years ago, people in Massachusetts, the core groups of radical activists, made up badges that were exact duplicates of the FDA badges except they called it FDA for direct action. And, uh, and they used these badges and they put them on and there was a picture of them on it, but in a gas mask and suit, that radiation suit. So, and then they went to supermarkets with wearing these badges and management thought they were legit for some reason. And they said, oh, we're sorry, we have to shut down your store because you have genetically engineered crops on here. And they were from the FDA. They saw the badge. <laughs> they saw the picture. <laughs> That's me in the suit, <laughs> the mask. And they shut down store after store after store that was selling genetically engineered food until they eventually caught on, but it took a while. Um, similarly, in Tennessee, there was a group of people who rewrote the law book. You know, they, they added like uh, their own pages to McKinney's Law Journal, the black covered books. And then when they went door to, uh, they went to different stores and said, no, we have to shut you down because you have genetically engineered stuff in here. And they said, oh, where's that in the law? We don't have the law. And so they opened the book and they pointed to the pages that they had added and the, where it says in specific, oh, the law is that you can't sell genetically engineered. 
And they did, and people, you get them to shut it down themselves. And that's just one example of creative direct action that's also fun to do. And there's lots more. Um, when um, we were revising Intro 0800, we, uh, a group of us met with, including Jay and, and um, uh, Doug Wood and myself, we met with Wilfredo Lopez, who was sitting over here, and he's uh, the new legislative aide to Ben Kalos. And he, after we were talking about some of the things we wanted to improve on in the bill, he said, you know, I live in the Bronx with my family and our neighbor sprays uh, Roundup. And he said, I really want to ban Roundup for private use also. And all of us were like, yeah, we do too. Absolutely, that's our goal is to get Roundup and other pesticides, toxic pesticides out of New York City completely. <laughs> wow, what an accomplishment would that, that would be. And we, we said, that will be the, uh, the next bill. Right now we want to get it out of the parks and public spaces, and then we'll move on to that. And one, that's with any kind of legislation, whether it's health, Medicare for all, or single payer. There's, you know, you're not gonna get everything you want right away, and there is a process. So we've been trying to negotiate over some of the, um, the improvements we want to see in the bill, and some may have to be in the next bill. So we're working really hard over the next couple of weeks to get in all, you know, very, it's, it's, it's a process, and, and there's negotiation, as, as you could see. But um, I'm just so thankful to all the people who joined in in that, in that effort and, and who tried to educate me, because I'm not one of the experts. So I appreciate everybody who who did get involved in it. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Alan? Thanks. Um, so I'm from Massachusetts, and several years ago, we tried to do um, one of those organic uh, policy things in Needham um, it, through a town meeting, which if you're not from New England, boy, it's a hell of a great ride. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Every board came down against us. The moderator, who is um, also doubles as Aaron Hernandez's defense attorney, if you all know who he was, um, made sure that the town wasn't liable, so he shut me down in speaking in, in, in meetings. The Board of Health came out against us, even though we had those waiver exemptions that um, folks don't like. So as we're trying to go through things this time around, we're trying like the nice approach and you know the happy signs and whatnot. We're not jumping on policy yet. But my big question is if I could get like a few sentences from each one of you, how do we get the doc on the Board of Health <laughs> who speaks out against what we were for? How do we turn this guy into our ally um, and I'd love to hear anything that anybody has to say. He's a doctor, um, thinks he knows it all, and you know, how do we get this guy to be our best friend and advocate? Um, so the first thing I would say is, you remember the three different types of bucket campaigns. You've got your hero campaign, you've got your cover strategy, and you've got your pressure campaign. We recommend that people don't assume it's a pressure campaign, but if you know it's a pressure campaign, you got to dial up the pressure. I think a lot of the communities that um, I work in, um, typically white middle class communities, we're not used to direct conflict. That's something that we're, I don't know, we weren't programmed to do or we're programmed to shy away from, or I, I should speak from my own experience, that, that I was. And I think that people are uncomfortable and I think we have to dial up the pressure on what is this person's pressure point. I'd also be curious to know how this person is at the Board of Health. Um, so for some communities, it's an elected position. For some, it's appointed. Um, so uh, sometimes it comes down to uh, electoral. Mm -hmm. It comes down to changing who is putting that person in that position, or it comes to re electing a new person. Um, we worked in a community in Uxbridge, Massachusetts, not on pesticides, but on sludge, um, which has a lot of pesticides in it. And um, ultimately, their board of health uh, wasn't doing the work they wanted to do, so they changed their whole campaign, and now two of the three board of health members we're members of that activist group and are making huge strides on a bunch of health issues. So those are my two thoughts. Yeah. Um, I agree with Harriet. Did you say it's an elected position? Then find someone to run against them. 
that's all of those people that were on that, we handpicked people to take people out. And sometimes it's a two, four year process, but it works. When people are scared when they have a formidable opponent. Um, and we got really comfortable really quickly with being like, look, we're just gonna get rid of you, <laughs> you know? Um, and the second thing I would say was, is um, we really had to get comfortable with um, having doctors talk to doctors and having Hawaiians talk to Hawaiians and having park people talk to park people. No matter how well schooled I am on an issue, I cannot walk into the Board of Health and talk to a doctor, even if I know all the facts, even if I've read all the, I just can't do it. So things changed with the chlorpyrifos thing when we had the American Academy of Pediatrics come and talk and we had scientists like I, they're not gonna listen to me. The Le legislator is not gonna listen to me. But when we had doctors talking at hearings to doctors, and going toe to toe with the people on the other side, then it became a no brainer anymore. So you have to recruit their peers to talk to them. And I think both of those educate them, and if they don't listen, take them out, you know? <laughs> Unopposed. Yeah. During the spraying, we, no spray coalition members who were just regulars just starting out. We didn't know much about pesticides at all. We just figured it can't be good. Um, and we interviewed many doctors in New York City and also in Connecticut. The doctors in Stanford, Connecticut all signed up against, and the health practitioners, nurses as well, signed up against pesticides. They just signed right on the back. In New York City, they didn't under Giuliani because they told personally, I interviewed dozens of doctors, they said that their funding, the research funding is based on, it'll get cut off under Giuliani. They were worried about their projects being cut off and they wouldn't take a stand. And then, and they were also taught to, or told by Schumer, who, uh, to frame everything as if it was a national crisis, uh, terrorism, anti-terrorism crisis, even though they knew it had nothing at all, the West Nile had nothing at all, but they started the first, if you look back at the beginning, when it first started in September of 99, they were blaming Saddam Hussein for the releasing mosquitoes in New York City as a terrorist attack. This was two years before 9-11, right? But I was stunned when I went back and saw those. I said, oh, I forgot about that. And they were all blaming, and I have a chapter on that in this book, on the whole series. So, and all these doctors, my point here is that all these doctors were told they had to frame it that way because we wouldn't get funding otherwise. And this way, Schumer was able to get some funding for it, and that was great. Well, that's true, they did, but what were the consequences? Two years later, when 9-11 happened, everybody was already primed for that way of thinking. So the thinking that we're a terrorist attack, that this is, you know, and that's really a, a major problem that if we don't own the framework, we're gonna end up losing, even if we win some minor things along the way. Um, uh, we have to thank some of the experts like Dr. Sarah Evans, uh, uh, from Mount Sinai, um, and Jay Feldman and other experts, as you mentioned, bringing, because they know farm, I don't pretend to be an expert, I don't, you know, that's their job. And so they not only spoke at public forums, but they wrote letters to the city council, and I'm sure they're gonna be doing that again after the bill is, is reintroduced. So we'll probably all be standing together at City Hall on the 18th. Um, the other thing for those of you, I know there are a few teachers here in the audience, kids can be experts too, first graders and kindergartners and older. They can be experts. My, my baby, my children um, met last June with two lawmakers. We met with um, Rebecca Seawright, who's the assemblywoman, and her, she and her staff were standing there astonished as the kids, because we, you know, we studied, we did research for months. They were astonished as the kids were teaching them about uh, pesticides. They went to Kirsten Gillibrand before her election campaign, met with her staff, and taught the staff what they knew. 
so that they could then work on legislation. So kids are spectacular, and they're probably more passionate than most adults, and they're really, yeah. <laughs> I think this is going to answer your question, and I think it's really important. Um, we, like, when we had a similar example with Chlorpyrifos, when Chlorpyrifos was not even on anybody's radar, mm -hmm. and when we were talking to even doctors in the legislature, they were, like, not convinced. So we brought out a few health experts to Hawaii, and we engineered this entire media frenzy, and this, I think, applies to a lot of things. We had this event where an expert talked at the university, we wrote our own press releases. We got her interviews on public television, on Hawaii News Now. So there's no way that people in the legislature didn't know this was happening. And it became, we engineered this pressure cooker situation where even if they didn't go to the talk, there were, we, we ghost, we, sorry, we took books, I mean, playbooks from the industry. We ghost wrote op-eds about her talk and had prominent people submit them to the newspapers. So there was this humongous, it's smoke and mirrors, this humongous frenzy around chlorpyrifos that we manufactured in like two months, probably. Um, so if, you're, if you don't know what chlorpyrifos was and you weren't feeling the pressure through this series of events, it was, it was like multimedia, you know? So then by the time we went back to the legislature, there's no, they couldn't pretend they didn't know anymore. So I feel like maybe, yeah. Wait one second, let me get this on, uh, one second. The mic is coming. Next. Yeah, the, I wanted to ask the, uh, in Montgomery County, did they employ the exemptions to do any spraying after you got that bill passed? Um, would you, would you report the question? Did you get, did you run into that issue in Montgomery County with, I saw that you had exemptions for ball fields, yeah. golf courses, um, have they been sp continuing to spray those uh, areas? Yeah, um, one of the reasons with the exemptions is that we try to get as much as we could, but some things you have to let go and f say for another day. Um, the golf courses, I mean, the, the industry is just so, has so much money and it was not where our kids are normally running around and rolling around every day. So we let the, that area go, and, but the. But, but, but the playing fields uh, was, was definitely a concern, and we fought really hard for that. But I think at the end of the day, uh, we knew we had to come back and fight for those again, you know, uh, and let that go for, in the meantime. Um, so, so right now, they're still being sprayed. The playing fields are still being sprayed. Um, and, and I think um, they, they're supposed to come up with a plan to take the playing fields uh, organically. So the parks um, have been slow on that, but uh, we're, we are saying and keeping pressure on them. So just because our bill passed doesn't mean we just go home and you know drop everything. If nobody is keeping pressure on them, then they're like, oh, you know, it's, it's like nobody's checking on them, nobody's. Uh, so parents have to keep the pressure up and that's, that's what we're doing with the parks. I was wondering, hi, I, I was wondering um, if you ever mentioned in, once you have people that are listening to you about the pesticides and have uh, understood how dangerous the pesticides are and the corporations that are selling them, if you ever um, try to connect together the chemical industry um, chemical industry with pesticides and fossil fuels and climate change. Because the way I see um, starting to grow, you know, agriculture without pesticides, it's all tied in with uh, understanding climate change and making big changes. I mean, even if in a local community you get your local community to not use pesticides, Pesticides are still an incredible big problem around the world because they are the way that agribusiness controls and colonizes the developing world. And it's all connected up with climate change. I'm wondering if you ever uh, try to move people, these very nice, concerned 
uh, citizens that you have working with you, do you ever try to move them a step beyond? Well, for us, uh, we, through our coalition building, we reached out to Climate Action Network. So, you know, we tried to work with the organizations to, to show them how these things tie in together so that we're, the issues are not siloed. For example, the pesticide issue like in Maryland, last year it rained so much. I mean, this stuff, you know, with, with climate change goes off into our waterways and then we're drinking it. So um, it, it definitely is tied in, but I think uh, but I think organizations sometimes are in their little bubbles and, and thinking about just that thing. And so it, it's a little, it's, it's hard work to try to push beyond the silos. So, but yeah, we're trying to do that. I was just gonna add to that, that again, it's making those connections for people. We use pollinators for that. They don't necessarily understand that climate change is impacting pollinators, there's the mismatch when things are blooming and the available flower for them and uh, the, the particular bee that needs that. And then also just for people to understand that fertilizers and pesticides relate to climate change. It just there's a lack of understanding. So for us at this point, it's more of a grassroots educational effort to make those connections. And again, it's, it's that launch of the conversation that's been helpful to make those connections. While we're working with children, we're also working with parents and grandparents and neighbors and, and friends. And there are opportunities, maybe not in a big public forum, but when you're talking one-on-one -on -one or in small groups, um, of talking about the issue of uh, pesticide use in war. I'm, I'm out of the anti-war movement, and you know, we, what did we do? We used Agent Orange all over the world, in Vietnam, but all over the world. And so the, the, the issue of pesticides and war, I'm not gonna bring it up in my, my kindergarten classroom, but I will raise it with some of the adults that, that I'm in contact with. So it's, it's very important that we bring the issues together, that, when we can. So I'll just say at Toxics Action Center, that's we don't silo ourselves in a certain issue. So I work on pesticides, water contamination, clean energy, landfill waste, you name it. And one of the reasons is exactly what you said. Uh, we really see public health and environmental threats as microcosms for how broken our system is. Um, and our you know, ultimate goal is people that we work with often are first time activists who get um, really inspired because the fight is, is very close to home. So the pesticide spraying is close to their kids or the pipeline is going through their backyard next to you know, their kid's window. And suddenly it's an entry to seeing how the whole system is, is broken and needs to change. And I'm just, I wanna lift up and thank you for naming that when we stop stuff here, it goes somewhere else in the world. Um, and I think that's something that the environmental justice movement and the environmental movement really needs to be thinking critically about um, when we ban things here, where do those products end up going and how can we be backing folks that are on the front lines of that contamination as well? Thank you. So the question goes into other dimensions as well. So why are they spraying if they know all this? They know the same thing we know and a lot more. So why are they spraying? Well, in New York City, they're using glyphosate now because it was the decision made about 20 years ago to cut the staff of the Parks Department by 80%. And that, that was successful over a period of time. And so people, workers, who used to weed by hand are now replaced by chemical applications, in this case of glyphosate. And because the city thought it would be a cost-cutting measure. They wanted to save money. And even though it wouldn't save money in the long run when you factor in health issues and everything else, but that was a decision that was made. And so there's a class dimension to, th there are many levels of dimensions in every issue, and there's a class dimension to every single issue. 
and that there's an ecological dimension to every single issue. And it's our job, I feel, as organizers to unpeel those dimensions and to reveal them so that it's no longer just saying, let me attach my issue to your issue, and they're totally different. It's how, what is, how is global climate change part of the same issue? And how do we unpeel that dimension and reveal it? How, do, how is class part of the same issue? How is ecology part of class issues? And show that and so that they all become part of one movement and not just concatenated, uh, but, not, but disparate movements. They're not disparate, they're the same. Great, okay. That's, that's all the time. These were great questions, and thank you so much. And let's give another round of applause for our panel for giving you guys enough time to ask those questions, keeping their, keeping their presentations really short. Thank them so much.